Year 9, Year 10, Year 11, welcome to your video on EQA Paper 1, Question 5. It's going to take you through how to get a Grade 7, a Grade 8 and a Grade 9. At the end of the video, I'm going to show you some example paragraphs that I've written that would get a Grade 9 and explain how. Before that, I'm going to take you through some quick wins, things that I teach my students that you need. You know, if you're looking to impress the examiner, get quick marks. Um, perhaps sell yourself as a Grade 7, even if you're not. I apologise like I do on all my videos in advance for my technology. My use of technology is awful, so I do record the screen. Um, apologies in advance, but please stay with me. There's a lot of good information in here. Um, and by the end of it, hopefully you'll be able to see how I write and, and hopefully mirror or adapt or steal some ideas. If we're aiming high, then I always tell my students who are the grade seven, the grade eight, the grade nine, that they should try and incorporate an extended metaphor. And that also applies to question five on EQA paper two. Extended metaphors in ha is a higher skill. So if you begin with a metaphor and you try and reference it throughout or you link it to the end, then you've got that extended idea. Structurally as well, the examiner likes to see a link in the opening and a link in the ending, whether that be exactly the same or, or a mirror image or something similar, vocabulary that's similar. Again, for structural reasons, that's a good thing to do. And they actually mentioned um, that that um, when I was in a meeting with, with uh, the AQA people that they enjoyed seeing that structural device. I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. Grip the reader, now, grip the reader from the get-go and um, there's nothing worse than being an examiner and reading papers and you lose your concentration and you're thinking about your tea or you're thinking about the weekend and then you have to reread a paragraph that means you've lost the person reading it you've lost the examiner and it's probably not entertaining do not waffle I always tell mine that if you're going entire sections, entire paragraphs without language devices, without a, a clear focus, then what's the point? And one of my students uh, in in one of my top top sets, if that's if that's the words we want to use, and um, would always do her creative writing and highlight where she knew the examiner would give her marks. By the end of it, if her if her work was covered in colour, we were winning, and if it wasn't, then we probably weren't. That's a simple technique you can do. Consider your paragraphing. Is it boring? Is it all the same length? Are you manipulating the reader so that they are wondering what's going to happen next? Um, can you use the colon, the semicolon, the brackets, the dash to really, again, emphasise something, heighten the tension? And as I say, do you incorporate a range of language devices throughout? Um, more so metaphor. Um, quick wins then. How do we quickly impress the examiner? Okay. The word imagine is a word they love. I think um, it's in Alan Pete's exciting sentences. Now you can do a few things with this. You can use it as a single word sentence. Imagine, full stop. You can use it as an imperative demand in the reader. Imagine a world without... Um, or you can use it to, as I say, introduce a description. Usually something emotive. Again, I shall show you an example of this if you stay with me. The triple abstract noun in the colon is a quick win. Again, if you start your work with that. So I've put an example. Despair, degradation, desolation, colon. The fields were left longing for some form of life. A slight glimmer of hope. Now, as an examiner, what are you marking? Your triple abstract noun and colon. And you have your alliteration there. And as I say, there's also that, that triple it leads you into your sentence. You have immediately gripped the examiner. None of this. There was a mountain in the distance. Straight away description. Straight away higher level skills. If you're struggling with abstract noun, then try the triple adjectives dash followed by the question or the sentence. So again, there's an example there. Cold, dark, airlessness, dash. She struggled to breathe. She even struggled to form a conscious thought. Now, you can either put a rhetorical question there or, as I've put it, put a sentence. But look, you've got triple adjectives with the dash and then your sentence follows it. So again, manipulation of punctuation, descriptive writing and a triple. Again, the examiner is going to be awarding you marks here for your language devices and your manipulation of the punctuation. 
double adjectives if if three is too many and you oh my god i can't think of anything mature and i'm going to be immature then take a double adjective ominous and harrowing comma the ebony night seemed to envelope the entire skyline so again you put your two adjectives your commas there your sentence i've tried to be clever there and add a metaphor in as well just for that extra showy off you show off to the examiner straight away if you can try and make your vocabulary mature but if you can't still double adjectives before the sentence it's always we are always now consciously crafting our work the fronted adverbial is simple enough, so use it. If, again, you're in mass panic, this is an exam, and I feel for you, you've got lots to do, then fronted adverbial is a quick win. Again, if we can use mature vocabulary when we do it, that would be wonderful. Apprehensively, the vines grappled with the trees, eventually establishing dominance over the natural earth. I try to tell mine to avoid things like slowly and quickly, and, and vocabulary that sounds like an eight-year-old but again if your vocab is not your strength still use it because it's still range of sentence types a range of sentence beginnings a verb beginning again nothing nothing difficult but it it shows the exam i can use a range of sentence beginnings it's nothing worse than i i i the 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 we 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 considering the inevitable drought has taken their livelihood the bigger strive to rebuild their once enviable plot in the basking Californian sun. All you need to do is check that your subordinate clause and your main clause are segregated by the comma and make sense. Sometimes people try to put verbs at the beginning and they haven't actually written a sentence. One word sentence, I love them. Make sure it's a key word. You could, when I was talking about linking the opening and the ending together, use your single word to do that. Okay, I can't obviously list millions of examples, but imagine was a good one, freedom's a good one, anything that's really pivotal and point to your description. The call on to emphasise something important. I've put two examples, um, one with a single word and one not. So we've got the natural world once again collided with mankind, call on. The only winner was obvious. Now what we're emphasising there is actually uncertainty because as a reader we think, well, well, who's winning? Is it the natural world? And then the second example is a little bit easy because it's only the single word that is emphasised. Amy only had one two, excuse me. Amy only had one two left in her survival kit. And then again, there's your tension. What is it? Your colon manipulates the reader, matches. Okay? So your colon to emphasise something important. If you haven't already used it after your triple abstract noun, after, after your triple abstract nouns, then again, we are manipulating the reader through punctuation. The brackets are the dash to act as a comma. So again, we know we can use the comma, but think about can you use the brackets and the dash as well to um, segregate your subordinate clause? I've put examples on here. I have made up the disease, so don't start Googling and thinking, what on earth? It's, it's not a real thing. It's not... I just made it up. So we've got Katie, who had infected the children with mundratitis, was quarantined to little avail. Okay, so straight away, you've got the brackets there. And, and actually, it's important because she's infected children. Or the dash, Mount Everest, which stood proud and erect, symbolised power beyond words, something timeless. So again, we've got this notion that it's standing proud. Nothing difficult. The brackets, the dash to act as a comma. So if you, if you, uh, excuse me, if you chart your punctuation, we should have the colon. The semicolon is straightforward. We would have a full stop anyway. We've got the comma. If you used a question, that's there. The brackets and the comma as well. We, uh, the brackets and the dash. We are giving the examiner a wealth. Uh, and a variety of punctuation. Um, structurally, as I mentioned earlier, can you link your opening and your ending? I've suggested a couple of things. It can be a similar sentence. It can be the exact same sentence. It can use similar vocabulary. Or it can be the opposite idea to the beginning. So I've used the example that I placed earlier with the triple abstract noun and the colon. Despair, degradation, desolation. The fields were left longing for some form of life, 
a slight glimmer of hope. Now, imagine that my piece has been written and I need to structurally link, structurally link my end to my opening. I'm going to use the light. Okay? Um, so the slight glimmer of hope is this idea of light. The light had now relinquished until despair reigned over all. So there's despair. It links it. And any form of hope has now been given up. So it's subtly linked. Another example, using my sentence earlier, ominous and harrowing, the ebony night seemed to envelope the entire sky. At the end, gradually the envelope opened to release the once trapped skyline. So again, we've got the idea that the sky is, is kind of trapped at the beginning and, and trapped in other things, but at the end it's, re it's opened and it's released. So you can see how the structure, the, the beginning and the end link. So think about that, guys. Quick wins, similes. Um, I tell my class all the time, please avoid cliches. Now, if you can't, because as I say, it's a highly stressful situation, the exam, and you're on to question five, so you've sat there for quite a long time, then play smart. Actually tell the examiner you're using a cliche, and at least you're acknowledging that you're doing it. So my example there is the sky, to use a cliche, was a deep blue, like the sea, only there lay a covering of a dense moss tenaciously holding peace ransom. So I've said that I know I'm using a cliche here and then I've just added some extra detail there. I think that's a way around the cliche rather than just putting the sky was, was blue like the sea, which does have connotations of a seven-year-old, okay? Outside and inside, again, Alan Pete with his exciting sentences. The outside reveals an outside action, but the part inside the brackets or the commas or the dash, whichever you choose, reveals the inner emotions. And that's a good one to show outwardly what someone's doing versus inwardly. I've put a quick example on there for you. She greeted every person who had made an appearance at the hospital. Inside, however, she felt like an exhibit in a museum. So you've got that juxtaposition of what's being shown on the outside and actually how the character or the persona feels. Paragraphing. Um, I spend my life telling my classes about paragraphing. So listen. Avoid paragraphs which are way too long in length. Okay, try to avoid that. Now, I'm not saying they should all be tiny. I'm just saying if you go on an entire page as a paragraph, I would say something's probably amiss. Try to manipulate the reader with how you open and end paragraphs. Does it begin with a simile and end with a rhetorical question? Does it begin with a complex sentence but end with a one word sentence? How are you um, manipulating the reader so they want to read the next bit? The first sentence of the next paragraph again um, ensures that they are entertained. So as a reader, as an examiner, I'm sitting thinking, oh, what is going to occur here? Where is this student going to go? How do your paragraphs link? How can you use ambitious vocabulary? How can you include the colon and the semicolon, the brackets and the dash? Is there an opportunity to use a one word paragraph? Is there an opportunity to use a simple sentence paragraph? Sorry, that should be punctuation, not vocabulary, but you get me drift. What I've done, I'm never ever going to predict every single question. So I have written four examples, I think, and I've tried to guess something generic that you can probably place in your descriptive writing, whether you choose the picture or the story. Now, this one, I've done an example related to the theme of time. Now, the theme of time, you can arguably fit into a lot of description. This is my example. Don't be overawed. I, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got years of English behind me. I, I'm an English teacher, but just watch how I've done it. Steal ideas, manipulate ideas, um, pick up things that I do. Okay, so time. Oh, it had lasted. In fact, it seemed to last beyond even the sands of time. Historically, the Egyptians were credited with creating the sand dunes, which were now gone. yes gone. This journey, although journey seems like an inadequate word, had stripped the world of man. Imagine earth without humanity, a desolate, barren, bare place void of existence. Pyramids still stand but their architects have disappeared into nothingness. What would become of this journey? Nothing. 
death, it waits for us all. Like the Valley of Ela, we were trapped in a circular space with little hope. A battlefield where the only victor was the ground, and even that seemed fickle. It would camouflage itself with the seasons, sometimes hard, sometimes soft, sometimes neither. What was certain was the burial ground. Masses of bodies lined up almost ceremoniously. So you have got, okay, a beginning that is quite short and, and I'm trying to grip, grip the idea of, or click on the idea of time lasting. Now, my history is not brilliant, so I've just made that up. Um, you have got, very simply, your front and adverbial. You have got, yes, gone as a form of repetition. That time has wiped away the Egyptians. You have got your subordinate clause explaining that journey doesn't quite fit with this, this association with time. I have used imagine because we discussed that earlier. I have got my dash here to really um, emphasise my triple. Um, imagine Earth without humanity, so the reader will imagine it. Desolate, barren and bare. And then there's your alliteration as well, quite subtle. Um, I've put my semicolon there. Pyramids still stand, but their architects have disappeared into nothingness. Semicolon. What would have become of this journey? Now, I'm not a fan of rhetorical question, really, so I answer it. Nothing. Single word. Death. Single word. It waits for us all. That ends the paragraph, which links us back to time at the beginning. So you've got that structural link. I've started my next paragraph with a simile. And you've got that reference to the story of the Valley of Ela. Um, You've got the colon to show us that there's a battlefield here, but ground would be victorious because um, death and, and time will pass and everybody will die. You've got your triple, sometimes hard, sometimes soft, sometimes neither. And then again, your dash. So next one. I've tried to do something related to the unexpected. So, again, you're only getting two paragraphs from me, so consider that this is not a full response. So I've started this time with our triple abstract noun and colon. Fury, despair, resentment. The connotations of the noun beach had been lost on that day, and for those left, it would forever symbolise something harrowing. Imagine everything you anticipate, everything you expect, everything you desire to be stolen from you until you exist, for no good reason at all. Even our imaginations cannot fathom the emotions which I have befriended over time. So let me return to that noun, beach. You picture the summer, laughter, infectious joy, but on this occasion the only contagion was that of something toxic. It appeared to pass from person to person until the entire horizon was decorated in dark objects and apocalypse would ensue. So I've gone down the line of something unexpected and I've related to the beach because we don't, we don't, associate these things with the beach so again what have we done if the examiner was reading it triple abstract noun with the colon okay i've brought in the fact that we're on the beach or there's a link to the beach if the imagine the picture was beach but unfortunately the connotations of that word are not present which we're going to come to later your vocabulary harrowing i've used imagine again look with my triple everything you anticipate everything you expect everything you desire is stolen okay i've mentioned how time has made us our sorry has, has affected our emotions straightforward and then i've brought us back to the beginning so there's your structural link okay let me tell you about that noun and i've used me call on there and then i've said what we would assume and then i've linked con something contagious and something toxic toxic with it okay people um the 2018 exam had a picture of an old man and a lot of students went into turmoil again. Don't go into turmoil. Now, again, I'm never going to predict the picture, but if we're describing people, make it metaphorical. So I've used this idea of a porcelain ornament. So we've got a porcelain ornament, fragile, delicate, vulnerable. Inevitably, her face had aged. Some would say gracefully, others would say ineptly. But from every angle, she remained poised and regal, as if boasting a great title. This posture was not natural. No, it was rehearsed like a dancer perfecting every turn and every pirouette. Behind the obvious facade, there was the body of a woman ruined. Deception could be seen masking her frailty. Upon closer inspection, she was completely flawed. Even her smile, which on first glance was an innocent white, 
signalled insecurity. Perhaps the ornament to be admired and aesthetic was overused and tainted. So nothing really about, I suppose, literal description, but there is and there isn't. So you've got your extended metaphor is going to be this ornament. And then we've summed it up with our triple, but single words this time. Your um, fronted adverbial is there, nothing too difficult. Bringing in age, but we've got the dash to bring in gracefully. We've got the juxtaposition of gracefully and ineptly. We've got this idea that she's poised and regal, but that contrasts with this bit where, where she's deceptive. We have got a simile comparing her to a dancer perfecting movement. Your semicolon. And then we bring in our extended metaphor again that this is a facade. This ornament that should be looked at is in fact ruined. Again, look at your sentence beginnings. There's a variety. So it's nothing too difficult, guys. Next one I've tried to do, um, being trapped. And um, this is the last one I'm going to show you. So I hope this is useful. So stay with me. If there's a question about being trapped or, or a place that you can link to feeling trapped, then this is, uh, again, an example that I hope you find useful. Almost as if premeditated, the atmosphere around us began to draw near. Like the grip of a northern clingfish, turmoil was massing in the palpable air. This particular grip held an untenable ferocity. Trying to breathe became an effort with each movement, a fight. A fight against empty air seems idiotic, but it holds a hidden danger. We continued on, anxious about voicing our concerns. Inside, however, the voices were reaching cacophonous heights. The crescendo of voices were too much, like a myriad of discordant instruments all sounding together with no direction. So again, what's been done, beginning with your uh, complex sentence, I've got a simile there. If you don't know what the northern clingfish is, it's a fish that has ridiculous power. Um, the, the fact that the air is palpable and then your pause and then talking about how the, the grip of the, the air is ferocious. Your verb beginning, your repetition of fight. And then structurally, this idea that we've got to continue even though we're trapped. This is your outside and inside sentence we discussed. So outside, we're, you know, we're, we're anxious, but we were decent. Voice it. Inside, there's voices all over because we're nervous. And then we've got this notion that the voices in our head are like music, music out of tune. I hope this was useful. Please go back for my quick wins. Don't overthink creative writing. Just always ask yourself, am I being mature? Am I being creative? Or am I being cliched? Am I saying the same things that a child would say? Um... And it is very, very harsh. And I say this to my students, read it back. If it is boring, then it's probably unsuccessful. Grade 7, grade 8, grade 9, please look back at my examples and steal what you can or adapt what you can or try to do um, what I've done and really, really set yourself a challenge. Reading will help you with this, okay? Um, read various books. You know, you've got a... You've got a massive choice at the moment, and especially on, on things like Kindles and on your phones. So read. My favourite is Stephen King, especially for manipulation of the reader. I hope this was useful. Please check out my YouTube channel for anything else. Apologies for my technology and massive good luck in your English language exam.